Perfect. That's good. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, today's meeting, thank you again, Nelson, for accepting our invitation. Uh, it's uh, it's a little bit hard to <laughs> pronounce your name, but I try my best. Dr. No worries. Nelson, Trujillo Pareto uh, is with us now, and he received his uh, Bachelor of Science with honors in nuclear physics from the Higher Institute for Nuclear, uh, nuclear Science and Technology. And then his PhD in physical science from the Havana University in 2006. So he's with physics background, and he's, it, it, this is actually the reason why he's uh, expert in brain dynamics and uh, computational neuroscience. Uh, uh, from 1995 uh, uh, to 2014, Nelson worked at the Cuban Neuroscience Center, uh, where he was the head of the department uh, for the brain dynamics. And uh, now Nelson is an uh, EP. SRC Research Flow at the Division of Neuroscience and Experimental Psychology of the School of Biological Sciences of the University of Manchester. I met Nelson actually in Manchester in September, and this is actually the, the main reason I could uh, you know, uh, invite him. Uh, Nelson has been involved in various collaborative efforts like uh, the Functional Imaging Laboratory at uh, UCL, the School of uh, Psychological Science, University of Manchester, School of Computing Mathematical Sciences, uh, uh, John Moore's University and the Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics and other other uh, collaborations. Uh, I'm not pretty sure about the uh, whether you <laughs> change the title of the presentation, but the one that I had was the explicit modeling of brain state duration in EEG and MEG. Uh, and the floor is yours. Thank you again uh, for for accepting our invitation. And please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. I will share my screen now. Let's see. Okay. Is it working? All good. good. All good. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, this this is a picture of the University of Manchester and where uh, Milad was very close to where he was actually visiting. So um, I will talk a bit about something that we call brain state, but it's not actually a brain state per se, or the meaning we have as computational scientists as brain state. So but I will explain that a bit later. And how we can model uh, these brain states uh, from EEG and MEG, and how we can uh, decode or infer these states from EEG and MEG. So this, uh, I will first, briefly talk about what my expertise is, what I do. And then I will explain what I call the brain state allocation problem, what a bit of the motivation for that. And <clears throat> I will show some of the approaches that the people use to infer these states or characterize this type of dynamics based on neuroimaging data. And they will compare one approach I have proposed. This is a work from a couple of years ago but I thought it was relevant for, for you guys and compared to some of the state-of-the-art approaches. So this is what I do. Basically, since I graduated back in 1995, long time ago, I started working in the brain and my, my whole research have been in trying to link what we observe in the recording machines at the level of humans in vivo, neuroimaging basically, to what's happening inside. So in that brain activity. And that entails solving two problems. The forward problem, which is how this neuronal activity or brain activity uh, uh, is uh, gathered by the, or is, is producing these observations. And the other way around, how given the observation, we can infer this brain activity and parameters of the model we, we formulate. And what I will present is a kind of the same, follows the same idea, the same, the same philosophical idea. And there's many ways of motivating what I will be explaining here. So let me just stick. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> but I choose to motivate it from the point of view of computational neuroscience because I'm a physicist. You guys are into computational neuroscience. So I thought that was appropriate. And and I will then want to show what's the relevance of what I will be talking about to computational neuroscience. And in that sense, specifically I'll be talking about whole brain modeling of a functional neuroimaging. And the usual approach to do that from the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years, the people are doing more or less the same thing, 
is to usually what the people do is to take information from the tractography of the brain, uh, the, the brain connectome, and then in each node of this network, uh, you can plug in a specific uh, uh, model that emulates the brain dynamics at that level of the node. Then you connect them using this realistic tractography, and then you produce some sort of observable. And then you fit that model by choosing a specific feature of your data that you generate or emulate, and then you compare that to that to the empirical feature, and then you minimize that fitting. And that is good and well. The only problem with that is that the conclusion we will gather from our modeling approach will be as good as our features represent the underlying dynamics of the brain. And that is a problem when those features are not good enough. And what I mean by not good enough, for example, for many years, uh, the people were proposing different kind of models, all of them with completely different uh, dynamical mechanisms behind. And they can, they could all, they were trying to explain, for example, the static uh, functional connectivity in the brain. So in terms of pairwise correlations between different nodes or areas or the activity in areas in the brain, and all of them could fit the, that static functional connectivity equally well. So there was no different accuracy really. So the question was, what's the purpose of modeling them? Because all of them give the same explanation. But the reason is that static functional connectivity is not a good enough uh, observable to model because you have to, in a way, the whole temporal domain there. So there's no dynamics. It's completely static. And therefore, most of the, of the dynamical models that you can put in there will explain that functional connectivity. So nowadays, the people have evolved from that. And now people try to fit something like a dynamical functional connectivity and things like that. But the way these this, uh, features are computed still have some issues. And some of those issues can kind of undermine the kind of conclusion that we can comp uh, uh, gather from the, from the data given our models. And I will try to show that here. So about whatever. <clears throat> uh, I mean, from the last, I don't know, 20 years or so, we have discovered that the brain is a lot more dynamic than we, than we, than we thought before. And that even a resting state, there are dynamical processes which uh, seem to have relevance for explaining brain behavior, uh, brain behavior and data. Specifically, empirical evidence support, for example, that a type of model where the brain uh, transitions between underlying hidden discrete dynamical regimes or both of operation, which we call or I will call here brain state is sort of phenomenological brain state, state because we don't know they are hidden, but essentially support this idea that the brain is a sort of a hybrid system that produces continuous data while kind of switching between different modes of operation. And evidence from that comes from the, from the literature about uh, related to uh, dynamical functional connectivity in fMRI and that kind of stuff. But we have discovered that this network seems to switch very rapidly from one network configuration to another. But whatever the feature we choose to model, identifying and characterizing these transitions requires segmenting the, the time series of data we gather could be directly EEG, MEG, or fMRI, or could be a feature derived from that. Uh, and segmenting to time segments that have some sort of relationship to these underlying dynamical regimes. And these features can be uh, extracted at any level of the activity. For example, it could be at the level of dynamical networks, or it could be if we take, for example, as an example, the, the way the EEG is generated, or it could be at the level of the sources, the dynamic of the, of the sources of the EEG, or it could be at the level of the, of the electrodes. For example, is some, is some work uh, trying to model fluctuations on the, on, on the sum of the, of the EEG rhythm or even wide band EEG under the idea that if there's high synchronization of different networks in the brain, that will translate into big fluctuations in amplitude outside the head. And I will be specifically talking about uh, fluctuations of envelopes here, but the, what the, the, the model or the method I, will pro I, I am proposing will work anywhere in this uh, hierarchy, could be at any level of activity. But the idea here is that these features can come from anywhere. It could be here, it could be even, for example, a, a multi-unit recordings, it doesn't really matter. The idea is the same. And once we, once we have segmented the activity in different periods of time or brain states, as we will call it in now, or micro states, some people call it, the idea is that then you can characterize that uh, switching dynamics in different ways. You can look at the specific networks that are activated during these segments, 
or you can look at the duration of engagement of this network over time, or you can look at, for example, the order in which these uh, networks are activated. So how they transition between each other. Yeah, and there's many methods that the people have proposed to try to analyze the activity uh, in, in this, uh, in try to segment the time series in this, in this, uh, in this way. And more for the most part, they can be classified in two different types of methods. One's which I call database or descriptive methods, and the other one is more model based or more, I say model based. It's more about a, based on a generative process that we assume. So. <clears throat> In the case of the most of the literature have been dominated by the database descriptive methods, and in there you will have methods like the sliding window method that is heavily used in fMRI to uh, uh, estimate. Uh, um, uh, sorry, to, uh, there's some feedback. I don't know where it's coming from. Okay, anyway, to, esti to estimate uh, dynamical brain networks based on fMRI and others like the microstates, which is essentially change point detection uh, algorithm. I will explain those. And in the case of the model base uh, approach, they uh, is essentially the brain state allocation problem is, is stated as an inversion of, the of a generative process that encodes how we think these, uh, the activities generated from those hidden brain states that we don't know. So, for example, in the case of dynamical functional connectivity or sliding windows, the idea is to most of these data database uh, approaches, they are based on three steps. In the first step you extract, there's a, a, there's a step of feature extraction. You, in the case of, for example, of dynamical functional connectivity, there's a sliding window. Then in each window, you compute a feature, which in the case of this network is, is just the pairwise correlation between different nodes of the brain. And that will define a connectivity matrix. And then you slide that window over the whole time series computing. And each step, you compute a new uh, correlation matrix. Then uh, you cluster those matrices into uh, to obtain four or five or n templates. And using those templates, then you can go back and classify the whole time series into different uh, states, they call it, depending on how far each of these uh, networks or sorry or connectivity ma matrices are from the, these templates. So in this case, for example, if you have four templates or four states, you can classify all every time point into one of these templates, and you will end up with a sequence of a state and co courses. Uh, <clears throat> one issue with this is that, of course, this will rely rely on the stationarity of the activity within that time window, so they, that this covariance matrix or correlation matrix has, at least has some sense. And there's no clear way of defining the length of this window because it should be long enough so that the estimation of the of the of the obtained correlation matrix is stable, um, but short enough that you can capture the, the dynamics very well, so you cannot collapse different uh, uh, states within the same window. So this is a problem where you implement this kind of approach, and it's easy uh, easy to demonstrate that in. Some, with some simulation. For example, here I have simulated uh, a switch between two different uh, causal networks. So you have five nodes here. This is a multivariate autoregressive model really with a switching at this time point. So if you use the appropriate time windows, of course you can recover these two very easily. But if you, for example, have overlapping windows for the green window here, you will obtain a superfluous or artificial connections that they actually don't, don't exist. The same estimate you will obtain is you have shorter time windows. They are not overlapping, they are shorter. So the window that kind of cover the transition will be wrongly estimated. And if you have a static network, which is just taking the whole time window to estimate the single network, but you will have all these sort of weird connections that don't, don't actually exist. So it's easy to simulate those issues. Uh, but more realistically, you will end, uh, when you look at data, you will probably have uh, states or length of windows that will have different, uh, sorry, the, this dynamic regime will last, uh, will have different durations. And in that sense, a fixed duration window, which is what we use in a sliding window, will not capture that kind of behavior. So in the case of another approach, which is uh, used a lot in EEG and MEG is the so-called microstate approach which is based on an observation from uh, Lehman, like in, at the end of the 
beginning of the 90s, I think, eight, uh, late 80s. So he observed kind of a bunch of e resting state EEG, and then he realized that from time to time, the maximum of the EEG topography will change, quickly change to from one topographical map to another. In respect, if you, omit, if you forget about the sign or the polarity of these maps. And he called that uh, microstates. And so they develop, uh, or the, that group developed uh, an algorithm which is very similar. So you have a feature, extra, again, a feature extra, extraction step, a clustering and a temporal segmentation step. It's just that here they say the feature extraction is different since you, we are, they are interested on topographic maps of EEG or MEG, could be applied to both. So the idea here is that they base this uh, uh, feature extraction on the global food power, which is just a variance, a spatial variance of the activity. So if you have activity which fluctuates a lot, you will have big variance. And the reason for that is that they claim that in those peak of the global field powers where you ha really have signal, where in the valleys you don't have any signal, so it's basically noise. So you focus on those peaks, you extract the topographies associated with those peaks, and then you cluster them. And then you go back and lay relabel all the time points, depending on how close these topographies are to the templates or centroids of the clustering procedure. The problem with that is that, for example, the points between these peaks, they are not considered for anything. And during the clustering procedure, there's no consideration of the actual temporal dynamics of this. So what is coming after what? The, that characterization is uh, done a uh, posteriori. So uh, as I said, the model-based approach is based on a generative process that we assume about how the activity is generated given those underlying or discrete uh, brain states. And in that sense, uh, recently, uh, so the first thing we, we, we do when we are faced with a new problem is that we look at what has been done somewhere else. And this sort of hybrid behavior has been studied in many different areas in engineering, for example. If we, you look at the literature about hybrid system, the hybrid system is a continuous system with some hidden discrete logic to it. And I have shown here a couple of very simple example, for example, a bouncing ball can be characterized as, as a two system where the free fall has some loss. And when during the, uh, when it is touching the floor, it can be, uh, for example, switched to, uh, uh, to a regime where it can be more very easily as a, as a compression of a, co of a coil. So this is kind of continuous system that kind of have sw is switching between two modes of operation. And that's, that's kind of a simple example, but there are others. So, so one example, which is perhaps more related to the kind of, uh, of system that we have is the speaker diarization, problem where you have a continuous signal and you want to segment those signals into different speakers who are uh, speaking during that, that recording. And that sense, for example, different speakers would be different uh, dynamical regimes that the brain is engaging at different times. So uh, the idea is, is we have uh, a system that behaves like or similar or emulate a hybrid dynamical system that which you should model those systems to model to model it. And this is the case of, uh, this is what we basically have done. And I, there is already some work in that direction. For example, people have already used one of the simple models, which is uh, given the recurring, behavior, the recurring behavior of this uh, uh, brain state. So the recurring time and in an order matter, so that it's not random, uh, it suggests a kind of a, a treatment using hidden Markov model. And some people have done that already. Uh, and for those who are not familiar, I, I assume that most of you will be familiar with this, but anyway, for those of you who are not familiar with a hidden Markov model, it's a, it's a kind of model that as I said, is, is one of the simplest hybrid model where you can model a, a continuous activity consisting of uh, where the, the dynamics of this activity changing over time and which switch between different behavior. And this is captured by using two stochastic processes, one which is discrete, which is hidden from us, and it's transitioning between different states. And each time it enters one state, it will emit some observation. And this is what we observe. The Ys is what we observe and the S are hidden from us. So the S are discrete. And this kind of models, uh, they have uh, usually the name Markov comes from the Markovian or the Markov assumption, which, may, which means that 
the, the states that the system is in only depends on the state in the previous time point. This is actually Markov of order one, but the, this is what we'll be talking about now. So, and this kind of model have basically three different parameters. You have the initial distribution of the state, which is unknown. We can, you can either postulate or you can actually assume that it's unknown and you can estimate it from the data. Uh, there is a transition probability matrix that controls how these states, hidden states transition over time between each other. And there is an emission distribution, which is the distribution that models how the activity is generated from that state. And that's basically what will characterize the feature we are looking at. For example, in the case of a network, this state, this emission distribution can, for example, be modeled using a Gaussian distribution where the covariance matrix of that distribution is the one that is switching and therefore can model correlations uh, over time. Or in the case, for example, of uh, envelope fluctuations or microstates, what is assumed to be switching is the mean of that uh, uh, Gaussian distribution. So in this case, then the, the states S can model our brain states that we want to infer or different uh, regimes of operation of the brain and the Y can model the feature of interest. And so far so good. So it seems that everything is sorted, but there's a catch here. And the catch comes from the fact that when you apply hidden Markov model due to the Markov assumption, the implicit distribution of the duration of these states over time is memoryless. What does that mean? So if you ask yourself the question of at a given time point, what's the probability that I will remain the same state during the next D time states, for example, that doesn't depend on how long I have been in that state. Yeah, that means that the, 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 that sequence or that distribution is memoryless. And this is the mathematical expression for that, but it's essentially that. So it's the, the probability of being, uh, if you are already at time t, was the probability of staying at time, uh, until time t plus k and then transition, it doesn't depend on t. So it doesn't depend on how long have you been already there. And there's also a problem. This is a geometric distribution implicitly. So it's, it's completely determined by the fact that the duration of a state in a hidden Markov model is modeled by self-transition. So the number of self-transitions you have in a state will be equal to the duration of that model. And that distribution has these shapes, which means that it will, it will decay very, very rapidly with time, meaning that it will favor durations of states that has, that, uh, which are very short. So if you have a system, then you have a state persistent, for example, this will, wouldn't be an ideal model for that. So and why this is important? The reason why this is important is because the brain doesn't seem to behave like that. So first, uh, uh, well, there's a very nice paper by, Von, I don't know how to pronounce that, sorry, von Beckner, perhaps, in 2017, where they, uh, using microstate, they analyzed the properties of the microstate sequences from uh, EEG data. And what they showed is that the microstate sequences are not Markovian, so the, the, the durations are not geometric of these states. And the output information, when you compute the output information function of this uh, state series, they show actually memory. So they, they decay slower than the Markovian prediction. And so they have a finite memory, although in the long term, of course, they, they, have, they fall be, below the Markovian prediction. And this is shown here. This is one figure from that paper. They analyzed, I don't know, 100 and something uh, subjects and the results were consistent. So what you see here is the auto information function from the uh, microstate time series. And what you see is that auto information has fluctuations that decay slowly over time. And in blue, you see the Markovian prediction. So it goes down very quickly. So that's one evidence. Also there are predictions from the whole brain computational modeling literature, where for example, uh, in 2019, Roberts and um, Brexpeer and et al, they model uh, interbrain synchronization. So they built a whole brain models of, of uh, neural mass models connecting the, uh, using the brain connect arm. And so in their simulation, they obtain that the interbrain synchronization seems to switch similar to, to the what, what's seen in, 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 in empirical data. And the duration of this uh, relatively stable coherence states they follow something which is not a geometric distribution. Actually, it has a peak and then decay very slowly. And when they feed that to data, they obtain they 
test a different kind of distribution for those duration distribution and they obtain basically most of them will be uh, the ones that has a very good fitting are the ones that are basically heavy tail distribution. So they decay slower than the geometric distribution. And this is to be uh, in agreement with empirical data. So in that same paper, then they collected, they use a, an MEG database and they run a hidden Markov model from the group in Oxford uh, with um, a, a MAR emissions. So essentially we're modeling cross spectral states. So how the cross spectral uh, density or matrix uh, change over time. And they found is that they follow something similar to the, to the model. So the best uh, fit in this solution were distribution which, which has a, a heavier than the heavier tail than the geometric distribution. So they decay, decay very slowly showing some sort of memory. Uh, why is that important? Well, uh, why, why, why being, uh, why I'm making such a fuss about dual time distributions or distribution or how the distribution, the duration of these states uh, are so important. And the reason is because uh, is, is some empirical results show that uh, when you look at, for example, again, uh, microstate uh, uh, sequences, and you try to uh, to characterize the long range temporal correlation of these sequences, which is uh, the, the some people have uh, have shown that they show multi scale behavior, meaning that you you have very significant long range temporal correlation up to uh, six dyadic scales. So. And the, and the thing is that when you shuffle the labels of the states, nothing happens. So it doesn't destroy that long range temporal correlations. But when you uh, equal, uh, equalize the dual time, uh, then the, it completely destroys this uh, multi scale behavior. So it seems that the duration distribution of these states seems to be something important and seems to be related to, to, to the dynamical principles behind the, the way this, uh, the EEG is generated. So this is a work from Vanderbilt et al. in 2018. And, but also in practice, if you have, if you model a, a system that is actually has state persistence, so state that tend to last very long, like the case, for example, in the, in the sorry, here, where you have multi-scale behavior uh, and you have heavy tail distributions of durations, some of these durations will be very long. And when you use a system like a hidden Markov model to model those, you will have things like this. So when you try to use something like the est estimate the duration of, sorry, how many states you need in order to reproduce that, that data, you will find that you will have a spurious state that's only there because the model needs to, uh, to reproduce that long, the long uh, state, the, sorry, that long state uh, durations by transitioning between different states of that very similar. So that will induce something like this. And this is shown by a paper from the Oxford group where the ones who proposed the hidden Markov model to analyze EG data. So if you look at the free energy of models that differ in the number of states that you are assuming, that free energy will, will monotonically, monotonically decrease as you increase the number of states. That means there's no minimum. So it's basically impossible to estimate the, the optimally the number of free states. And that is because this uh, implicit duration distribution that you have in the hidden Markov model will favor small durations. So in order to reproduce something that seems to be the case in the brain, something that have the long duration, you will have to introduce more and more states. So to solve, solve some of these problems, uh, we propose here to use something like the hidden semi-Markov model. So hidden semi Markov, for those of you who are not familiar with this, is very similar to hidden Markov model, except for some one specific conceptually, they're very difficult, they're easy to distinguish. In the case of uh, hidden Markov models, you have one emission per state. Yeah, let me just go back for a bit, sorry, just to show you here, because I forgot to mention this. Uh, they say the constraint here is that you only have one emission or one observation per state visit, yeah? In the case of hidden semi Markov model, this is relaxed. So you can, in each, uh, every state visit, you can have a whole segment of observation. How, how that is important, how that uh, makes the, the model a lot more flexible. The reason is because during the duration of the model, the Markovian assumption doesn't need to be 
uh, confirmed, doesn't need to be uh, accomplished, and that it is only required to be verified when there is a transition between two different states. And that introduces a lot of flexibility in the way you model um, uh, state durations, because you don't need that, that duration, you can be modeled explicitly. So there is a lot, a bit of mathematics involved, but essentially, you can, the, these two models, the hidden Markov model and hidden semi Markov model, are so similar that you can actually embed one inside the other. So if you simply extend the state concept by, in, 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 with two dimensions, one to model that models the states and the other that models the, the duration or uh, the time remaining in that state, you can essentially apply the same mathematics. The thing that the only thing that changes is the transition kernel. So the transition distribution has now has two is a transition between two uh, uh, bivariated states, but essentially the rest of the mathematics is the same. So depending on how what assumptions you make about this transition kernel, you can have many different types of hidden semi Markov model. But we will focus on one is uh, one of the simplest one, which is simple but. Uh, uh, flexible enough to capture what we want. So if we assume that the uh, that the duration of a state this is here, that the duration of a state only depends on the state we are in, then the, there is a factorization between the duration distribution and the transition distribution. And that allows us to explicitly model the duration distribution with any distribution we want. So in the case of the hidden Markov model, that's fixed because it's completely determined by the uh, self-transitions, but in this case, self-transitions are not allowed. Otherwise, you have in the in, in the way you define a duration, but the duration can be modeled directly using this distribution, which is the duration distribution. And that allows us to, in practice, uh, use that information to try or compare different possible duration distribution. This duration distribution, as we will see a bit later, can be associated to different dynamical uh, a primitive or dynamical mechanism behind the generation of the data. So this is just a representation of the two models. So in here, as you see in the case of the hidden, hidden semi-Markov model, the cell transitions are replaced by uh, an explicit duration distribution, which could be geometric, could be uh, he log normal, a heavy tail, Pareto, whatever you want. So, uh, I initially had a lot of simulation uh, here to show you, but I decided to just show one exemplary simulation, which I, I think captures the, the main problem and then show, show you some interesting uh, actual data. So in this case, we are simulating uh, data uh, from uh, EEG data from uh, the sources. So we can uh, have some putative sources here, the source distribution inside the brain. And then we uh, generate durations based on a very simple distribution. It's just a uniform distribution around a given mean distribution. So, and we can control the width of this, <clears throat> and the, which is the variance and, and the mean of this distribution. So how long are the states that being generated? So here we have three states. The, then we produce the, the topographies using the forward model of the EEG. So you can simulate the three associated topographies, then we, add some Gaussian noise to these uh, observed sequences of topographies. And this is the data that we use to reconstruct the, or the sequence of states. Because this is the way the simulation uh, was implemented. So then uh, when applying our model, we then use, instead of using a uniform distribution, which would, wouldn't be fair for the duration, we use a normal distribution for the to model the duration of the states. And then we use a, uh, a normal distribution to model the states per se. So where we are basically uh, modeling the sw a switching in both the mean of the distribution would be these topographic maps and the variance. And this emission distribution will be basically the same for a hidden Markov model and the hidden semi-Markov model. The only difference for, with respect to the hidden semi-Markov is that we can model the, distrib the distribution of durations explicitly and we are using it just a Gaussian here. Yeah. So the first thing to notice is when we apply both models, uh, the HMM is it behaves very, very, very well. I mean, you, you can see here, this is just an example of a reconstructed sequence of states. So blue, green, and yellow are the three different states here. A hidden semi mark behave a little bit better, but we, we will show now why. But hidden Markov model is, is not 
so bad. I mean, it's a very extremely flexible model. It can behave very well even when the data doesn't uh, have uh, the, the assumption of the of the model doesn't kind of uh, explain the data. And the reason, the but the main problem with that is that we have simulated this in red. We here we have the, the duration of the distribution. So if we want then after we have fitted those models, you, uh, those models, we generate new data from the fitted models. What you see here is that, of course, the hidden semi -mark, uh, the hidden Markov model is in, cannot reproduce the behavior of the original system because it will have an implicit a geometric distribution to control the duration of the, uh, of the state. So it will basically have, we will generate duration all over the place. It will allocate a little bit of probability uh, on durations closer to 50, which is the one we used to simulate but it will have probability even higher for lower duration distribution. In the case of the Gaussian distribution can effectively allocate most of the probability around the true mean of the duration. Uh, this is kind of a trivial example. We will show you why uh, it is important to model this duration at least approximately correctly. And why is this important? Because if then we want to make predictions based on these models, then the hidden Markov model wouldn't behave well. It will fit the data well, as we saw, but it will be a bad predictor of, the, of new data. And to show that, we simulated a classification example. So it's a very simple example. You see here we simulate the population, let's say a population of subjects. Each of these subjects will produce data with different duration. Here we are changing the mean of the duration distribution from two. It's the same, uh, the rest of the simulation setup is the same. So we're just, here, uh, here we have, subjects that will differ on the duration of their states from two to 30 units. Then we train different models for different subjects. And then we then simulate from one of these models, new data. And they were, the task is just to classify that new unlabeled data. We don't know where it's coming from. Or, well, we know, but we, we, we pretend we don't know where it's coming from. So we use Viterbi decoding to the code with each of these models decode that new data and we assign that subject to the to the, the to the model that has the highest probability of having generated that that uh, sequence. So this is just a metric we use to compare or to classify a subject as being one from one model or the other. But it's just what this measuring is just the the probability of that new sequence being generated by one of these models that we already have fitted to the to the population. And we, what we find is that, of course, the uh, hidden semi-Markov model is, is able to allocate, as we see, the, the mass of the distribution to the correct mean duration. So it's able to discriminate that subject from anything else. But in the case of the hidden semi uh, hidden Markov model, since it will have more or less the same probability everywhere, it cannot discriminate that new subject from any of the other that where it is it was trained. So this is a, just an illustration of why modeling the, your data correctly, even if it's not a biophysical model, it's just a, a time series model is important because depend, you, for example, can choose to fit your computational model to some of the features like the distribution of duration or the, or the transition this, or the transition probabilities or whatever. But if they don't represent what you what the generative process in some way, or they're not, uh, not a good representative of that, then your model would, uh, your conclusions based on your computational model might be incorrect just because it's uh, trying to represent or to explain something that doesn't represent the dynamics. So and so uh, now, now we will I will show you some uh, actual data. Uh, I chose this example, which is that uh, there is a prediction from uh, uh, from um, um, from the whole brain models where uh, different dynamical mechanisms have been predicted to produce the uh, say similar features when you use them to model, for example, things like uh, envelope fluctuations in the data, the specific, uh, specific rings, rhythm. And most of them has come up with uh, distributions of the, the duration of the fluctuations in amplitude in the EEG that are close to power law, or at least they have some uh, a long or heavy tail. So we use then some resting state data and show how we can use this methodology that we just proposed to select or between competing different 
uh, uh, sorry, between different uh, alternative uh, duration distribution. And that will allow us, allow us then to say something about the underlying mechanisms. So uh, what we did was to, this is a, a, sorry, this is wrong. It's not one subject, it was actually six subjects, but anyway, it doesn't really matter. So in this case, we can, the, all the subjects are concatenated. Uh, so it's the data, the EG was band pulse filter between four and 30 Hertz. So these results here are in wide band EG. So we try to do the same here. So we extract the envelope, Hilbert envelopes here. And then what we want to model is actually these fluctuations in all the channels. And ideally after applying the hidden semi-Markov model, we will come up with this different sequence of states. So how many states will be also inferred from the data because we're using a Bayesian approach which uh, that allows us to do that. So the, the, the setup of the model is similar to the simulation. So we are using uh, Gaussian emissions. So we're assuming that the envelope fluctuation distributed in as a Gaussian. So I didn't say that, but here we log transform the amplitude so that they resemble more Gaussian distributions. And then we will compare three different duration distributions. So we will compare log normal distribution which is sort of a long tail distribution to normal distribution and to the hidden Markov model, which is has a geometric distribution implicit. So uh, here are some of the results. These are the estimated brain maps for each of the five states that we extracted from the data. And what we see is that all the states are kind of similar across the different models, except for the case of the normal model where normal duration model when you have there start to be, uh, there's some difference for brain state three, four and five. But essentially the topography is for like, the log normal model and the geometric model are quite similar. Which you will see how, that it makes sense. Uh, in the case, the, the other parameters that you can infer from, from the model are the transition distributions, which in the three cases are quite similar. Again, the normal distribution has some differences, but they are quite similar. And the state occupancy, which is the total time a given state is occupied the frag, uh, as a fraction of the total time, they look similar across models too. But the duration distribution seems to vary quite uh, a lot between the different state and the, between the different models. For example, in the case of the log normal model, there seems to be durations that can last up to 4,000. And in the case of the normal model, these durations or this distribution uh, allocate probability for durations below 2000. In the same case for the uh, geometric distribution. So apparently, uh, this uh, in this case, the uh, state occupancy or the fractional occupancy is not a good uh, metric to differentiate between different models here. And there seems to be some uh, evidence in favor of the log normal distribution. When you see here, is for one of the states, what is the fit in between the analytically obtained in log scale, analytically obtained cumulative distribution of the durations compared to the equivalent, but in the histogram, just by counting the duration of the state that comes out of the model. And you can see there's a, a lot better fit in between, uh, for the log normal distribution compared to the Gaussian distribution, which doesn't capture the tail at all. And in the case of the geometric has, there is a good uh, fitting for short duration as, as is the case for geometric as it's intuitive here, but it fails to capture the, the tail of the distribution. So a state that has high persistence so they last a long, a, a long time, this distribution cannot capture. To be more specific and to have a quantitative uh, comparison between these two models, we take advantage of the Bayesian formulation that we have of this of the inversion of this model, that uh, in there we can calculate the negative free energy of the model, which is a sort of, it's a metric that uh, takes into account both the accuracy of the model and the complexity of the model. So it's a trade-off between the two and give you a score of how good that model is. And as we see here, we use it for both to inferring the number of, uh, of brain states. So here is different models that the uh, small that differ in the number of uh, brain state assumed that this is the way we infer the optimal number of, of states. As you can see, the maximum value is for five states. But also you can see there's a difference, significant difference between the, uh, between the free energy of the different, uh, of the log normal, normal and 
geometric model with the low normal model being the highest one. So apparently the data supports, uh, has the highest support for the low normal distribution. And this is a way that would allow us, for example, if you, we suspect that uh, our data uh, has certain type of behavior uh, of the distribution, we can actually compare that behavior to different types of duration distribution. So finally, I will show you an example of the application of this kind of models for analyzing some uh, uh, clinical data. In this case, we're, uh, we're analyzing some Parkinson's disease data. Uh, here, uh, this is a idiopathic pa pa uh, Parkinson's disease patients. In this case, we were interested in on, on, on explaining what happened before and after a, a, a training uh, intervention of this of this, uh, uh, sorry, of these patients. And this intervention is proven to have some uh, improving, improving effects in the way these uh, patients behave, specifically the, the synchronization of the tapping and the gait uh, improves. And the, the intervention consists simply in walking to a, a, to, to a music, uh, to, to a beat uh, a music. And then this intervention was carried out for four weeks. So we recorded the resting state data before and after the intervention, and we compared these two uh, states or these two uh, uh, data for both controls and patients. What we found is that, again, the brain states, uh, sorry, we use a low normal distribution in this case, since, well, everything seems to indicate that it's a, it's a good model for the, for the duration. So what we found is that the different, we inferred five states again, the topographies and um, reconstructing maps of these states for the three, uh, for the five states are similar uh, in between controls and, uh, and patients. And as you can see here, uh, the duration or the fractional occupancy of the states seems to be recovered uh, compared to controls in three of these states. So here you have control. Uh, the pre-training the pre -training states and the post-training st state. And after training, you can see that the duration of these states seems to be uh, recovered and reach levels compared to controls. And this will happen for uh, state blue, uh, orange, and, and yellow. However, some other states did not recover, which seems to be consistent with the, with the, with the behavior because although there was improving, uh, improvement in the synchronization of the finger tapping and the gait, this has, uh, there was a kind of a variable response with some subjects didn't respond and in the same way or some even got worse. So uh, since we have concatenated all the data in order to, uh, to, to infer the model, this seems to be kind of uh, reflecting that kind of variability across subjects. In the case of the state transition, however, what we see is that most of the transition, the order in which these uh, states tra transition between each other seem to be recovered at, uh, after training. So you see here, this is the uh, transition matrix between uh, the different states. And here I'm just uh, visualizing it as, as, as arrows. So indicating what's the order of the transition. So for example, here the whatever blue state is, uh, is, has a higher probability to transition uh, to the yellow state after, after it's finished and so on and so forth. So and this configuration or pattern of transition is recovered after training. Um, but most, most of them will, bear, uh, or many of them will alter during the, uh, in, in Parkinson's disease during the pre-training. So this is more, this essentially what I had for you is just the take home message. I mean, for all of this is, the, is, is what I said at the beginning. So one, even when, when we are using computational models to explain some feature or some data, we have to be careful about what feature we are explaining. And there is, we, we, there is a lot of work that has to be done in how to marry these two, or how to bridge these two uh, levels of description, the level of description of the level of the mechanisms and the level of description of the level of the data itself. And this bridging is not easy to make, but something important is that whatever we choose as a feature to explain has to reflect something uh, important about the mechanisms that are underlying it, the mechanisms that we are modeling in our computational model. And in that sense, I see this as an iterative process where predictions from our model can be incorporated 
as information that can be used as priors or constraints to extract meaningful features from the data. And this is what we have done here. If you remember the, the figure about the predictions of different dynamical mechanisms that they have different duration distribution, uh, the main conclusion from there is that we need to use, at least in the case of resting state data, to use uh, the, uh, the duration distribution half a long tail. And I use that in, in the data and we can, and we reconstruct it, or we obtain state sequences that have, or features that can apparently have a, a better meaning or a, a more a easy, more kind of a meaningful explanation that if we haven't used, for example, something like, if we have used something like a geometric distribution or a standard hidden Markov model. So here is just to, just a kind of summary of the conclusions of, of, the, of the talk, but it's basically it's just to highlight the advantages and a, similarities with uh, between the hidden semi Markov model for modeling EEG and, and MEG compared to hidden Markov model. And there's uh, of course a lot of work to be done here. For example, a, we have used a very simple emission model, which is just a Gaussian distribution. We have now developed uh, other emissions model that given that we're in a, in a state, we can model, for example, a whole state space model. So that will allow us to, for example, a model things like DCMs or, or neural field models as an emission model. So each state will be a different neural field model or simple, as simple as instead of just modeling fluctuations in the mean, we can uh, model fluctuations in the whole spectrum. Like for example, we can have emission models that integrate uh, full multivariate autoregressive models so that we can model not just fluctuations in amplitude but also fluctuations in, in phase. And that will allow us to have a, a richer representation of what is going on in, in the brain. So this, uh, these are the main members of my, of my group who have uh, contributed to this work. Uh, my old time colleague, while he used to work in Manchester, now is in, in Chile, enjoying a good sun there. And two of my PhD students were also coming from Chile. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nelson. It was great. Um, <clears throat> I have uh, <laughs> several questions, uh, technical and general. Uh, so I leave the technical one for our, uh, you know, uh, future one-to-one -one meeting. But then my very general question uh, that I wanted to ask was, uh, what is your comment on uh, the interpretability of these uh, hidden states because when you um, show these states on the topographic map and then showing this heat mapping you know it shows this kind of you know active activity of the brain or crosstalks <clears> for which <throat> i'm thinking that you know this is also back to our conversation um you know before that you know some other modeling may be also used within this context to 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 extract you know other information uh, and uh, so, so my very, very uh, general question for, for which I, I really appreciate if you, I mean, you don't need to go through the details, but your general idea about the interpretability of these uh, states. And also, what do you think that uh, these kind of modeling framework can be used uh, if you also have, or if you want to also include some behavioral, I mean, it can be whatever, uh, and you mentioned about this clinical outcome in Parkinson's disease, but then in general, uh, when they're generative, they're generative to replicate something like neural activity for sure. But then what if you also have some behavioral data? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Actually, uh, that's what I was kind of hesitant to call these brain states because they're not actually brain state in the, in the sense we know from computational uh, mm -hmm. modeling. So what we call brain state is, state is, is actually uh, state in the physical meaning. So in here, uh, I, I think in the abstract, I call it a phenomenological brain state. It's actually what we are actually detecting are periods in which this activity seems to be stationary in mm -hmm. some sense, or at least quasi stable in the case of, for example, of the, of the amplitude fluctuations. And the idea behind that, there's an implicit idea that these fluctuations actually are the one that has some meaning or at least reflects a period of time during which the brain is doing something which is more or less the same thing. And that comes from the idea that, from the resting, the literature from resting at network, if we believe that the brain, the behavior of the brain is determined that by, by the connectivity 
mainly. So, and this connectivity seems to be kind of this synchronization between different areas seems to be kind of stable over a period of time. Then it's valid and kind of reasonable to say that if we, or to interpret these stationary periods, if we're, for example, modeling networks directly or even fluctuations, which as I said, a high synchronization period could correspond with a big fluctuation in the EEG, for example, then that's the thing that has some meaning for us. So if that can be related to some mechanistic explanation using computational modeling, that's the, that's the big thing to me. Because and the link that's and that's the, the thing, the main idea of the whole, all these things. At the end of the day, this is just a, a time series model, right? right? You could model with that and a, a, a factory of shoes, and is still valid the model. Uh, but the main idea here is that if you can then incorporate information from the prediction of your computational models into that inference procedure, that you then you are kind of basically constraining that general model in a way that kind of is tuned to the kind of processes that we want to, it, it, it sounds like a circularity, but it's not a circularity per se. It's like, it's that, and that's the way the science works. So you go with the model, try to explain some experiment, then you get some nice results, others then you say, you, you, you realize you have to go back and modify your model. It's the same uh, thing here. So the more we invest in trying to both, going from the two ends, improve our way, we, inf we infer this, we, we deal with the data by informing that from the physical point of view and trying to then uh, make our models more kind of explanatory of the actual, of, 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 a, of a feature that is actually meaningful and not like the people used to do like five years ago, just trying to explain the static functional connectivity, anything can really, the results of all that literature it was like, yeah, just by looking at the structure, you will explain the static functional connectivity. So when we started to look at something more dynamic, Right. Then we get a, a more a better explanation. So in terms of the behavior, uh, that's another big, big, big step. The flexibility of this model is that since you can model continuous and discrete emissions, you could also have a kind of a process that also incorporates uh, behavioral behavioral emissions, and in that case, it means it's kind of discrete data it could be different conditions, experimental condition. It could be different groups. And you can plug it in there um, too. That's the flexibility of that model. But as I said, the interesting stuff is happening in the this bridge that we have to still to build between the computational models and something that you can name it if you like, uh, explainable machine learning approaches if you like. But that's the idea. And in that sense, we I I think we we are applying for a for a for actually for a grant to work because as as you saw. These emissions are linear. We're just explaining means and some covariance. Even if you use something like a full state space model in the emission, it's still linear. So we know the brain is not linear. So uh, things like, for example, in that uh, line of research would be to incorporate nonlinearity. We can think of things like switching Gaussian processes and things like that. So that, that's the, the next step. OK, that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your response. Um, yeah, so now's the room for the question. Maurizio, please. <clears throat> yes, thanks, Milad. Uh, thanks, Nelson. Uh, very nice talk, very informative. Um, I think I'm going to catch up on what Milad was saying. So I was thinking about these results that uh, you presented. And um, so we do actually not have any kind of biophysical insight on what makes these transitions. So, I mean, we we assume that actually the pathway for transition is the same, right? Uh, because of the uh, Markovian approximation, we don't have any kind of memory after a couple, like after the, the step of T plus two. But I would argue that in, uh, somehow, uh, right, there is a sort of uh, hysteresis in the trajectory that uh, your brain uh, develops uh, on the way. So this is most the technical question. So like how, what is the status here of the, of the debate on, these, uh, on this possibility? Like we might have multiple transitions between two states and uh, the type and the nature of the transition could be dictated by 
somehow the history of visitation of the entire attractor space or the local attractor space? That's the first question. The second question is more general. I, it bumps to my mind. So I could use the same model, right? And exactly more or less the same model to, to exactly reproduce a completely different data in terms of technology. I could ask exactly the same kind of behavior for EEG or MEG or TMS, but the biophysical processes behind are completely different. So this is a little bit of a, of a trick because I'm actually observing completely different physical quantities and the transformation between EEG to magnetic fields and whatever other is strongly nonlinear. So how, how, how do you deal with that or how do you argue against this? this I'm not saying the model is very good, but it's still a little bit tricky when we, when we think about the biophysical meaning. Right, that we are looking at. Yeah, yeah. The, I will answer first the, the second question. Uh, yeah, you are completely right. I mean, it's that's what I was saying to Milat. The interpretation of this is uh, strongly depending of where what are you applying this model to. Of course, this requires a lot of insight of how, how the generative process of that signal. Uh, uh, is and in the case, for example, as you said, in the case of EEG, will be completely different to the case of MEG or the or the MRI or the ball signal or whatever. So and even the temporal scale at which this switching occurs, are, of course, are completely different. So you and one has to be careful of that. And since we are mainly dealing with data, so just blind to what mechanisms are behind it, we have to be careful about those interpretations. There's a lot of where I'm trying to relate, for example, things like microstates, which this is kind of what I showed is kind of similar to microstates, and how that relate to uh, functional networks, switching from uh, functional networks in fMRI. And they seem to relate some, some of these states seems to be connected, but others don't. So, and, but we know that fMRI and, and EEG and MEG are quite, quite different. Sometimes you have even fMRI TV without no EEG associated with it and the other way around. So interpretation is an issue because it's not a biophysical model. And how these states, which then relates to the first to your first question, how this specific, I, I find myself difficult to call it, but since I chose to call it brain states in the talk, we'll continue with that. How these states or phenomenological segments, if you like, these seg segments of data relate to uh, to what's going on at the mechanistic level in terms of the of the dynamics, actual dynamic that is behind it, it's it's an unsolved questions, of course. Some people, for example, uh, there's a big debate about that. Some people, for example, associate uh, these microstates as specific uh, metastable states in the whole process so that uh, if you believe the idea that the brain is close to a critical transition all that stuff and and then in a given during resting state you are actually visiting all these kind of metastable states then you can argue that perhaps these states could be approximate approximate linearizations around because we are using linear models anyway around this metastable point but it's not it's it's not really a there's no it's no there's no way to establish a kind of direct connection there. Yeah, the only way is to do some sort of modeling and see if when you simulate activity, for example, using a realistic computational model, and then you what sort of of phenomen phenomenological, if you like, then states you obtain. I predict that. For this specific model, linear model that I am showing here, uh, it will be very little relationship, if you like. So it will be difficult to establish that relationship because, as I said, the brain is not linear. So whatever we are telling uh, by using, there's a bit of a of, a, of an improvement, if you like, when we extract, extract these features using this kind of model, just because of the fact that we are at least saying that if there is one of these excursions in the dynamics that last long, like uh, for example, if you are close to a critical transition that you have this long excursion from time to time, then you can allow that in that in, in that kind of data model. And the contrary, other models wouldn't allow that. So that's the only thing that you could say, well, 
whatever feature I am obtaining there could be closer to what's actually happened in the model. And therefore I can use that feature in order to fit my computational model, which is the one that has the explanatory power. I, the, this one doesn't have any explanatory power. You can make those connections between the phenomenology, you know, the, the duration distribution, if you believe, for example, that uh, actually the duration of the actual states in your computational model has kind of some long tail distribution, like the work of Breakspear and, and all these guys, uh, then you could say, well, at least what I, the information I'm plugging in in the data processing model is kind of consistent with that view. But it's, it's an unsolved problem. I mean, linking what we do, whatever we do to the data, to the actual biophysics is, 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 is a big problem. We are not still clear how to actually, for example, go from the microscopic model to the mesoscopic scale. We, we do our stuff, uh, physicists, we always do, uh, you know, mean field or dynamical mean field, that kind of stuff, statistical mechanics, and we come up with nice uh, mean field models or neural models, but uh, there's a lot of there, like, for example, what happened with the neurotransmitters. So usually we just model quite a lot the activity of the neurons, but forget about the dynamics of the neurotransmitters, which is now, now it's becoming more and more and more popular. We actually have a paper we kind of obtain a mean field of as, as of the neurotransmitters as a, or the whole system as a as a two system couples. Uh, you can see all sorts of different dynamics there. And then you can incorporate uh, there a kind of empirical information about the concentration of neurotransmitters using pet data and that kind of stuff. And then you can obtain completely different sort of dynamics. So it, it is it's, it is a, a difficult problem, but the important thing is that to avoid what happened some years ago that any computational model will fit that observable that the people were chosen to kind of, for example, uh, select between different mechanisms. We have to avoid that. And the only way to avoid that is to inform that processing of the data in a way that kind of is consistent or more or less consistent what, what, what we believe is happening in the brain. So in that case, because you know, you know how computational uh, modeling works. So you have two hypotheses of different things that you think might be happening that you try to fit into your data to obtain a kind of meaningful parameters. And, and that's what the people were doing. And all the models were fitting the, that feature equally well. So how do you select? And that was a kind of sort of a crisis. So it was not the problem of the modeling per se, it was a problem of the feature that the people were using to was not discriminative, discriminative enough. Okay. Thanks. Great. Um, <clears throat> Miguel, please. Hey, hello. Uh, thank you, Professor Benson, for the talk. Uh, I have a quick question for you. Um, do you have any plans, uh, for example, to include uh, another priors? Uh, oh, for example, I start with a non informative priors, and when I advance the times, incorporate uh, another kind of distribution prior, like a gamma, beta, or something like that? Or multivariate distribution, for example. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, in this implementation, what we have here, you, you, when you say prior, you mean prior on the parameters of the models, or or you are referring to priors on the dynamics, like uh, another kind of another type of the of duration distribution, for example, something like that. Uh, maybe the, the the first one, for example. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah, of course, in this case, we are using just non-informative priors, which is not ideal. Not to be true, it's not, uh, that, that's not completely true. In the case of the duration distribution, since we know that from the literature on microstates, which is closer to what we were showing, uh, this, uh, those guys have been studied for quite a long time now and in resting state. And we know that, yeah, the durations were between 25 milliseconds all the way to 500 milliseconds. So there are parameters, uh, there's one parameter in particular that I didn't mention. So you have to choose what's the maximal duration of your states. So what's the maximal possible duration? It's not really necessary. So you can have it the whole time series or even infinite. It's just that then the computation is, is massive. So you have to select to truncate that. And in that sense, there's some information included there because we truncate that up to three seconds, which is more than enough, I think. So it will be difficult to see in the EG more than three seconds of stationary activity, really. 
So, and that's the, so in that sense, there's some information there, but yeah, you are completely right. The more information you incorporate, the easier to, for example, infer things like the number of states and that kind of stuff, because otherwise it's, everything is not informative, uh, it's essentially just maximum likelihood you are doing, <laughs> doing anything else. So, but yeah, the, the idea is to then uh, try to uh, incorporate more information like the one I said, based on the, on the data. That's, that's the whole point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other question? Just check participants. Uh, uh, just one one point uh, that you know we I mean for those who are uh, with KCN, we will share the link in the KCN Slack channel. But for, for for others, feel free to email me or Francis. Uh, we will share the link. And also one uh, I mean I mean it's a question slash request if it's okay with you to share the slide. Of course, you can remove yeah, the yeah. ones that, that would be perfect. So I'll follow up with you in the email. Uh, and yeah, it seems that there is uh, no question now. Uh, okay, I wanted, I wanted to thank you again. It thank was you. Great talk. <laughs> <laughs> I should follow up with, with some more technical questions, but I really appreciate your time. Yeah, we'll have a meeting pending, yeah? Yes. <laughs> Yes, 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 yeah. Thank you. Very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Bye, everyone. Bye.